Let's look at a little bit of God's word in the theme that has been brought to us today from Luke chapter 2. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Uh, before we look at uh, this scripture, will you join me in prayer for a moment? Gracious Lord, as we look at the message of the angels, what did they announce on this week before Christmas? I pray that you would teach us, I pray that you would empower us, and I pray that you would enable us to, uh, as Linus laid down his blanket, to lay down the things that are getting in the way of hearing that message. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, yeah, so the, the week before Christmas... The heralding, the angels coming, and uh, I thought, what is it about that message from the angels? What's the focus there? And the first thing it said was, glory to God. And now that's important to remember at our baseline. The first thing the angels said was, this thing that's going to happen demonstrates how glorious God is. That's our background. But what is the result? On earth, peace to those who accept the Christmas gift of the sun. And you've got this word here, peace. In the Greek word, it's irene. In Hebrew, they say shalom. And that's our main consideration this morning. Shalom, peace. And before we get there, let's not go too quickly past what's going on with the angels because the angels are involved and we don't talk all that much about angels because we don't see them very often. They're sort of backroom boys. They're behind the scenes type. But nonetheless, they are true. They exist and they are very involved in the work of God. They dwell with him and they've got clear communication with him. There's no confusion. So what do we notice about the angels here? The first thing we notice is there's a great company of them, a great company of them. And that's important to remember because sometimes we feel that the world is all against us. And when we feel that the powers of this world are so strong, it's important to remind ourselves that the infinitely powerful God who created the heavens and the earth has at his command an immense number of powerful angels. And we know from the Bible quite a few things about these angels. For instance, we know that the angels are very interested in mankind. So we'll look at a few scriptures talking about that. Peter, in 1 Peter 1, is talking about what's been revealed to the prophets over time. And he said, it was revealed to them that they're not serving themselves but you, that's God, when they spoke of the things that have been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. And then that last line, even angels long to look into these things. They're interested. They long to look into these things. What else do we know about angels? We know that they reverently admire how wise God is and then wise in his dealings with us, human people. In Ephesians 3.10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. That's where the angels live, the rulers, amongst the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. And we know something else. We know the angels rejoice over the least worthy person who becomes a believer. Luke chapter 15, verse 10, in the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. They're watching. They're involved. They know about it. They know what's going on in your life, the things that you're struggling with. And we know that angels also work to help accomplish what God wants done. Hebrews 1 verse 14 is a very encouraging one. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We might not see the work of angels in our life, but this scripture says that they've been in there. They've been working behind the scenes. And of course we know that the angels are profoundly interested in our Saviour and they're filled with joy and they worship him. Look at this picture from Revelation chapter 5. I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 upon 10,000. That sound like a lot of angels? 
It does for me. And what are they doing? They're encircling the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they're saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. And then it goes out further. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that's in them saying, To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. And I think it's really good to lock into the comfort of knowing that the Lord has 10,000 times 10,000 angels, which is really a way of saying he's got an incredible lot of them. He's got many, many. And this multitudinous force joyfully announces in the week before Christmas both the glory of God and the coming of the Saviour to the world to bring what? what we're talking about this morning, to bring shalom, to bring peace. And that word peace is a focus word. A lot of things come into that. The purposes of God come into it. The coming of Jesus to save sinners, they're all focused in this word peace on earth because God sent his Son to bring peace to us, to the world. So let's see if we can look at some other meanings of this word peace. And the first thing we've got to say is that the word we use for peace, our English word, and indeed even the Greek word for peace, are not big enough. They're not big enough to contain the range of meaning that the Hebrew has when the Hebrew people talk about shalom. And we know Jesus spoke Hebrew. And the New Testament is written in Greek, but it means that the fuller Hebrew meaning that was in his mind and heart is probably needs to be brought into the Greek, it needs to be brought into the English so that, we can, so that when we see and we read and we talk about that word peace ourselves that we'll have a, a bigger understanding of what the Hebrews thought about when they said shalom. And I think the situation is that for most of us, most Greeks, most English speakers, when you talk about peace, what do you mean? You mostly mean there's no conflict. If there's peace, then we don't have a war. If there's peace, there's no trouble. But is that what we see around us in the world? The absence of trouble and conflict and war? No, not at all. That's not the situation, is it? We see pretty much what John Bunyan, the guy who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, saw many years ago and he, he talked about a town which he called Vanity Fair and Vanity Fair for him was a town where people were trying to live without God and where everyone is striving for what's not worth having. I love that line. Everyone is striving for what's not worth having. He was writing to London during the time of Napoleon about 200 years ago and in that time people were living for Sound familiar? Materialism. They were living for promiscuity. They had countless diversions, with none of which satisfied their soul. Today, Vanity Fair, people attempting to live without God, what do they live with? Drugs and violence and knife crimes and abortions and euthanasia, confusion about gender, unwillingness to be disciplined, lovers of self, so on. All of that adds up to a lack of peace that most apt TV series I've ever heard is The Young and the Restless. And that is what so much of the world is. They're restless because they have no peace. They, they suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. They've got the angst. They've got emptiness. They've got a hole inside because they're looking for peace but not finding it. They're all looking in the wrong place. And so when this multitudinous group of angels, the hosts of heaven, were so joyful, it was because they knew the peace that everyone was looking for has finally come to earth. And the baby Jesus was going to be the source of that peace for which everyone was looking, everyone was yearning. And that's the message of the Bible, that it's impossible to fully have the peace that you're after unless you find it in Christ Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong here, there are moments when people feel pretty satisfied with their life, if they weren't, 
said uh, they wouldn't carry on doing what they're doing. Because most people feel peaceful when they don't actually have any challenging circumstances to face. Things could be going well, they could be healthy, they could be financially pretty well off, they might have a pretty well balanced work schedule, they've got time for fellowship, they've got time for family and friends. But that type of peace can go in an instant. It went in uh, an instant when somebody announced COVID. And one of the reasons that's been such a big challenge to so many people is because their feeling of peace has been based upon the lack of challenging circumstances. And you add in lockdowns and you add in the fear of inoculation, you add in the coming vaccination passports, they have shaken the foundation of peace for many, for many people because their sense of peace is based upon there not being any trouble. They only have peace when they have no troubles. But as we look at peace, we want to note that peace in Jesus is not just the absence of war. It's not the absence of challenging circumstances. Because Jesus told us, that told his followers that he leaves us his peace, not as the world gives peace. And one of the foundations of the Jesus' peace is that his peace is that of eternal security. It's a realisation that the number of our days on earth are but a twinkling of an eye compared to the everlasting glory that we're going to experience in heaven. And the true meaning of shalom, so true peace, comes from our position in Jesus. The peace that trans all, transcends all understanding is based upon an unshakable foundation of the truth of our position, our situation, our qualification in Christ Jesus. Things like that we are adopted to be a child of God by God the Father for eternity. The situation is that our future inheritance in the kingdom has been set aside and just awaits us to take possession of it. The situation is that regardless of the circumstances in what's going on in our present life, we can have and enjoy true peace. So Jesus says this about that. In John 14 verse 27 he said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And that means if you have his peace, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. That's the words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. The English Standard Version re translation reads it this way. I'm leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and peace of heart. And the peace I give you is a gift that the world cannot give. Vanity fair will never find it for you. And so don't be troubled or afraid. Paul picks up that idea in Philippians 4 verse 7 when he says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Uh, the world can't understand how Christians can still be happy if things are going bad. It transcends understanding. And so Jesus is telling us this. He's telling us that regardless of our circumstances in this present life, we can have and enjoy true peace. And the Bible acknowledges it's not just Jesus on its own, but it's the complete triune God who provides this peace. Who's our peace? Jehovah God. Look at that in Judges and in the story of Gideon. The Lord says to Gideon, Peace, do not be afraid. You're not going to die. And so Gideon built an altar to the Lord there. And what do you call it? The Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. Psalm, in the Psalms, you see it? In peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Who's the source of our peace? Look at Psalm 29. The Lord gives strength to his people and the Lord blesses his people with peace. And of course, how many times have we sung this this year from Isaiah? For unto us a child is born, a son is given, 
The government will be on his shoulders and he'll be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. He'll be called the Prince of Peace. Last week, Hayden talked to us about covenants, sacred agreements between God and man. Did you know that there's a covenant of peace? Ezekiel talked about this, that Jesus would bring a covenant of peace. We go look in Ezekiel 37 for that. And my servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. They're going to follow my laws. They'll be careful to keep my decrees. They'll live in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, the land where your ancestors live. They and their children, and their children's children, will live there forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. And I will make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. I will establish them. I will increase their numbers. I'll put my sanctuary among them. And my dwelling place will be with them and I'll be their God and they will be my people. And Paul brings peace in to the covenant in Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God. So we put several of the things we've got so far. We've got peace. The gospel offers peace for all who believe. The teachings of Jesus, if you live in Mount, you'll, have, you'll live peaceful lives. The Holy Spirit living within, that brings peace to believers. If you obey what God tells you, his lordship, that's going to bring peace into your life. So in Jesus, we've got a peace of conscience, which comes when we confess our sins and ask to be forgiven. We have peace of heart when we put our trust in him. We have peace of mind about worldly matters for we pray his will to will, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we have peace and union amongst one another. That last point is referred you know, in the angel's first message when he said goodwill to all men. People who know God's peace are just nicer to one another. But there's more. To the Jewish people, this word shalom is a very vibrant word. If you look it up in Strong's Concordance, you'll see that shalom means completeness. It means wholeness. It means health and peace and welfare. It means safety, soundness. There's tranquility. There's prosperity, perfectness. Fullness, rest, harmony, the absence of agitation or discord, health or well-being. That's a lot, isn't it? You know, it's not just about stopping doing something and then you'll be okay. It's about go on to something better. This is better. So let's explore a couple of those aspects. The sense of well-being is involved in shalom. Think back to the story of uh, Joseph. He's sent out by his father to his, to his brothers to see if it is shalom with his brothers. Which is ironic because what do they do? Sell him off to slavery. But it's used again when Joseph asked his brothers when they were in Egypt, he said, How? asked about his dad, he said, and they said, oh, he's alive and he's in good shalom. He's in good peace. David, being a naughty fellow, asks after the well-being of, asks after the peace of the soldiers when he brings Uriah back. But it's more than just personal well-being, it's, it's the well-being of others. Take the story of Jacob, he's off to take his wife from his family, of his mother, and he gets near Laban's country and asks the shepherds and says, Hey, Laban, how's he going? Is he Shalom? That's in Genesis 29. So it's about the, the shalom, the well-being of others, their health and well-being. What else is it? It's contentment. If you looked in Exodus chapter 18, uh, you've got uh, the sense of satisfaction or contentment involved in shalom. And that, that story there is uh, Moses can't keep up with judging the people and he's... Oh, I don't very often get a chance to mention Jethro in a sermon, but his father-in-law, Jethro, <laughs> gives him a job. He said, look, take other guys, assign, assign judges, and then the people will go home shalom in peace. They'll have a new system. It's also 
friendship. A peace which goes beyond just settling a, a dispute. It's about having friends with the person that you've started to have a fight with. In Obadiah 7, we see that those who eat your bread are called shalom. Those who eat the bread, your friends, are shalom. They're peaceful. Uh, and although in, in Obadiah they abuse that friendship, it still points out that friendship and shalom, peace, go together. Let's skip past that one. Okay, on to the word shalom. Also represents in the Hebrew language having been paid in full a settled debt or redemption price having been satisfied. And let's not forget, what did we have in the Garden of Edom? Shalom, peace. And we all yearn for that. So it's no wonder this word shalom has been taken as a greeting to one another. For shalom, in actual fact, is the answer to everything. It's the focused answer to everything we're after. But are we experiencing it today? Are we experiencing Peace. Are we experiencing harmony? Are we experiencing wholeness, blessing, security, completeness, health, prosperity, rest and contentment? Do we have the shalom through Jesus, through our relationship with God, a shalom which goes deep down into our hearts? It's not just the absence of conflict. It's the presence of something more. Shalom is when everything is what it can be, when everything lives up to its potential. It's to reconcile and to heal a broken relationship. When rivals make shalom, they don't just stop fighting. They get on together. They start working together. And it's what leaders are supposed to do. They're supposed to bring shalom Remember this blessing from Numbers? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. It's not a peace which removes all your troubles. It's a sense, or sorry, it's a peace which you have in the midst of your troubles. Jesus declared this in John 16. He said, these words I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have tribulation. People say, why do bad things happen? In this world, you will have tribulation. But, but, be of good cheer, because I have overcome the world. You know what happened in 597 BC? You weren't there. Nobody here was there. Judah was captured. They were taken off to Babylon and they got a false prophet said, oh, it's only going to be two years. But Jeremiah said, no, mate, it's going to be 70 years. And if you want to know what decent tribulation is, then consider being conquered and evacuated and taken off to another country for the rest of your life. Where's the peace there? And when we think about Shalom, we mostly think, as getting it for ourselves. Oh, I know I want peace. We think, poor me. And so there's the Jews. They've been taken away. They're saying, poor me. They're feeling there's no peace in this situation. And what does Jeremiah say to them? This is what their Lord Almighty says. The God of Israel says to all those I carried off into exile to Babylon. What's it say? Build houses. Settle down. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. And also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it. Because if it prospers, you will too will prosper. Well, we are actually all exiles, aren't we? We're on this earth until the Lord returns to take us to his heavenly kingdom. How are we living with the peace of God now? Is it flowing out of our lives to those around about us? Are we seeking the shalom of Babylon? Are we seeking shalom wherever we do life, at school, at work, in business, in our families? Because that's what should happen. 
the peace of God which passes all understanding in us should spill out. It should uh, make an impact at work. It should make an impact in your family. It should make an impact at the gym because that's what the calling of exiles is, to be yeast, to be light, to not just be a church in Mecca but to be a church for Mecca. And Jeremiah is telling these Jews who have been taken away into a situation of no peace, he's saying, pray for your captors. Pray for your city. Because God wants us praying, as Trevor did just a while ago, praying for our leaders, who we may think are pursuing diabolical political agendas. Pray for them, not just think about how we can uh, win the battle against them, but pray for them for shalom for them because that's what God wants us in our exile he wants us holding out Jesus to people he wants us saying the shalom you're looking for is in Jesus if you know Jesus you know shalom and so that's the context of something which you've heard a lot let's look at it in Jeremiah 29 10 this is what the Lord says when 70 years are completed for Babylon I'll come back to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place and in that context he says this for I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord plans to shalom you and not to harm you plans to give you hope and a future will you pray with me Lord, we are carrying around blankets of things that we think need to happen for us to be happy. Will we take the courage to look into this promise as given to the Jews in a time of exile when things seemed against them, when there seemed to be nothing going right and they knew they were going to be there for a long time, which is going to be the lifetime of many of them. And still the Lord says, there is peace there for you in me. And the Lord says that to us this morning. There is peace in this situation. As long as we let down our expectations of what we think should happen, as long as we can reach, put them down and reach our hands out to you, so, Lord, please take my hand. I place my trust of my peace of my mind, the peace of my heart. I put my faith in you for the outcome. So we pause for a moment, Lord, and we, we, lay, we lay down what we need to lay down. And we hold our hands to you and say, Lord, fill us with your peace, which passes all understanding. We accept your promise to us. We accept the shalom of God. Hallelujah and amen. <laughs>